Hello, it's John Heaton, and today I'm going to revisit a classic album, one of my all-time favourites, and it's an album which I don't think gets enough praise in general uh, from the critics, uh, and it's Super Tramp's Crime of the Century uh, from 1974, probably regarded as their first really classic album, even though their first two albums had a lot to recommend them. And it was released on the 13th of September 1974 and they had a new lineup. Well, apart from Rick and Roger, who were still there, we had John Anthony Halliwell joining on sax and various wind instruments. And we have Bob C. Benberg on drums and Dougie Thompson on bass. Um, so Bob C. Benberg, American, John Anthony Halliwell, English and Dougie Thompson, Scottish. And Rick Davis and Roger are both English, although it was quite interesting to note that they came from very different backgrounds and it was, they made such a good combination together in terms of their musical partnership, certainly 1974 through to Breakfast in 79, Breakfast in America, um, sort of the yang to the yin kind of complementing each other, different styles, very different personalities. Ken Scott, who produced this album, Crime of the Century, um, is saying that they had very different personalities and that kind of was reflected in the in the in the way the music turned out. Um, I'm disappointed that this album doesn't get talked about very much when you, when it comes to like best albums of all time or various lists. Um, and also there's no ultimate music guide edition for Super Tramp, which I found very disappointing. Um, I just want to compare it to, say, Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, Dark Side of the Moon, which came out the previous year, 73, in which everyone raves about as being an all-time classic, which it is, but this album hardly gets a mention. I'm not saying it doesn't get mentioned, because the fans love it, but just I would like to see a bit more love given by the so-called critics. Um, the other debate I could have, or one could have, is, you know, what makes a great album? Is it the lyrics or the music? or both. Um, I think it's a combination of the both. Um, Roger Waters would probably tend to say that the lyrics are the major component of an album. He certainly thinks that about Dark Side of the Moon and he re just re-recorded re the whole album and he's re released time and money in, with just him singing or whispering more like. And uh, it misses the whole sort of musical magic of Pink Floyd and I think this album lyrically covers some pretty dark themes as well, uh, like mental illness and loneliness and uh, maybe oppressive school life. Um, but without the musical genius of Supertramp, it would be quite a depressing listen, um, taken alone as poetry. Some of these words work quite well, but um, I think that what makes the album great is the musicianship between the five members. They really gel. Um, Rick Davis is a superb keyboard player probably the most talented of the two in, in terms of piano playing versus Roger, who is a decent piano player. And then John Anthony Halliwell just brings a whole new palette to the whole proceedings with his clarinet and sax throughout Supertramp's albums. Wonderful stuff. And Dougie Thompson and Bob C. Benberg provide a wonderful rhythm section. And um, I don't know how Bob C. Benberg achieves his drum sound, or, or sorry, should I say how Ken Scott achieves it because it just jumps out of the speakers at you and particularly his use of the bass drum uh, it's just wonderful throughout the album and I want to give Ken Scott a lot of credit for that obviously he has a lot a good CV before he worked with Supertramp he was an engineer or assistant engineer on various Beatles recordings and also on All Things Must Pass and uh, a lot of the early Elton John and uh, David Bowie albums, Lou Reed, Harry Nielsen, the list is almost endless. Um, interesting that this album was recorded at uh, three studios, Trident Studios, which is in Soho, which is where most of, or a lot of All Things Must Pass was recorded, and also uh, Ziggy Stardust, David Bowie, among others, and there's a plaque outside near at Trident, um, sort of dedicated to David Bowie, which doesn't mention Super Tramp or um, Badfinger or all the other bands that recorded at Trident, but there you go. Um, another studio they used was the Rampart Studio in Battersea, which was owned by The Who, and also a studio in the Euston Road in London called Scorpio Sound. Um, so those are the three studios. Um, 
So I'll get on to the tracks, I think, now. I'd, I get a bit annoyed when people say, oh, this is a prog album. You know, what is prog, progressive rock? Um, this, this term gets banded around and people say, oh, it's one of the best prog albums of all time. Well, I would go further and say, forget the label prog. It's one of the best albums of all time, period. Um, is it a concept album? Not particularly, but the songs go very well together. And there's a kind of theme amongst them in terms of school, you know, starts off talking about Roger's life at boarding school, which wasn't the happiest, but it wasn't the most, it wasn't like Roger Waters level. I mean, he, he wasn't that miserable, but um, Rick Davis picks up on that in the, the second song, uh, Bloody Well Right, when he says, and so you think your schooling is phony. I guess it's hard not to agree. You say it all depends on the money and who is in your family tree. So I detect a little bit of sort of um, patter between the two lead singer-writers because Roger was a public school, boarding school type uh, boy and uh, Rick was more uh, sort of middle class, lower middle class, came, born in Swindon, went to, went to state school I think. So it's amazing really with the, such different backgrounds that they managed to get on so well together, um, but they did. And uh, the album opens with school with a wonderful harmonica line and then uh, the, the sc scream from the, the girl in the schoolyard just before the drums come in is, is wonderful um, and is supposed to imply all kinds of things, I guess. I think Roger said that in an interview. I'm not quite sure what it's supposed to imply. But uh, anyway, it's a great track. And although it's Roger's track, by and large, Rick did help with the lyrics and he, he contributes the superb piano solo, <coughs> which reminds me of... You know, another piano solo he did later on in the, two, in the group's career on Child of Vision, where he just, it's a Roger song, but he just just adds a, a bit of magic in the last couple of minutes of the song with that ad, sort of ad-lib piano solo, and he does the same on school, and it's just absolutely brilliant. And I remember back in the day when you went in to buy a hi-fi, um, the guy in the hi-fi shop would either put on Dark Side of the Moon or he'd put on Super, uh, Crime of the Century, to demonstrate how good the speakers were and try and get you to spend hundreds of quid on the latest, sort of, uh, the best speakers. Um, anyway, Bloody Well Right, as I say, leads in nicely from school with a similar theme, and it's uh, Rick, tongue-in-cheek, lyric, and uh, I'm not sure how they got away with it in terms of how it was played on the radio with that word in it, which was, at the time, considered almost like a swear word, but uh, these days it doesn't mean anything, of course. Um, anyway, it's a, an amusing song with great musicianship. Again, lovely intro from Rick Davis on the keyboard, and then it comes in, and then oh, just wonderful guitar from Roger Hodgson um, throughout. And then Hide In Your Shell is Roger Hodgson sort of singing about his insecurity and trying to hide his insecurity, but... Um, it's also quite uplifting and he's he's looking for some kind of spiritual answer and uh, I find this song musically very uplifting even though lyrics lyrically he's on a bit of a quest um, and maybe he hasn't quite found found the answer um, it's a very uplifting tune and it's a favorite of a lot of people uh, Asylum is, is, is does deal with a, a dark theme but uh, I think it, uh, the musicianship lifts the song and the string arrangement is wonderful and I love the lines like um, uh, someone lend me 15p I'm dying for a smoke because if you can believe it back in 1974 that's what a pack of cigarettes cost 15p I'm guessing <laughs> it's a bit too early for me to comment on but uh, you know, these days it cost whatever 12 quid and back in the day it was 15p obviously inflation is uh, has it contributed to that as well. But anyway, I digress. Uh, moving on to side two, we've got Dreamer, which was an original demo which Roger had recorded, and he got a really good feel on it, and they tried to recreate the demo in the studio, and they struggled for quite a while. And so they ended up kind of doing a kind of not a bad job of it. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a track which perhaps doesn't bear too much repeated listening, but it's, it's uplifting and I love the way Rick contributes various lines in the song um, towards the end. And uh, yeah, it's just compulsive musicianship, what wonderful. Rudy is a favourite of mine on the album and uh, it's a self-reflected track, of some say autobi autobiographical from Rick um, about this sad character who's a bit sort of lonely 
and he's traveling on the train and there's a wonderful bit where they say recorded at Paddington station the train at platform four or whatever it is is for Bristol Temple Meads calling it Reading Didcot Parkway Swindon Chippenham Bath Spa and Bristol Temple Meads now the reason I know those stations so well is because I traveled on that train many many times going down to see friends in in the west country and just a little side story for you if you get off at Didcot Parkway and you walk about a mile and a half south southeast you get to a village called East Hagbourne where Tom Baker and co filmed the Doctor Who story the android invasion so I've been on a pilgrimage there twice with my kids and I recommend it to all you Doctor Who fans you just get off at Didcot and walk um, so that's East Hagbourne. Anyway, another digression for you. Um, this is the German audiophile edition, which has a gatefold sleeve. So the original idea behind the back cover is they were looking at the, the, the bars, but uh, if you look at that, they're actually looking a bit too high up, so the bars are a bit low here. So if they wanted to have a true gatefold concept, then these bars need to be up here somewhere. But anyway, that would have ruined the look of the cover, wouldn't it? So... Um, Anyway, in, and on the original copy of my album, these lyrics are on a sort of separate insert inside with this as the, as the backside of that. Here they're displayed in the gatefold, so it's quite nice to have that. Um, we've also got a version of even the quietest moments on gatefold, uh, which is very nice to have. So um, I haven't found yet a, a gatefold of Breakfast or Crisis. If anyone's seen them, let me know. So what else have we got to say? Well, we were on, we talked about Rudy, wonderful track, and the train tracks, when they play it live, they, they have the train tracks whizzing past, and it's very effective sort of video backdrop for the song. By the way, I have to say, whenever Supertramp do play songs live, to me it doesn't match their studio work, because I think, to all intents and purposes, they were a studio band. They were really on the top of their game in the studio with various producers like Ken Scott, and uh, people like Peter Henderson coming in later in their career and just producing an absolutely brilliant sound, which they can't quite reproduce on stage. They do a fair approximation. It's not bad, but it's just I don't tend to listen to the live stuff. And there is a fair bit of it available. For example, this deluxe Crime of the Century CD has a whole disc two with a live concert from Hammersmith Odeon from March 1975, where they literally play... Um, I think I'm right in saying they play the whole album of Crime of the Century. They do, interspersed with four new tracks from the upcoming Crisis What Crisis album. So that is an interesting listen. I just don't go back to it that often. Um, if everyone was listening, is a very uplifting track from Roger. I was talking about how the music could be uplifting on an album. Well, in this case, it's the music and the words, because it's Roger basically sort of a plea to humanity to let's... let's um, you know, try and do a better job of looking after each other. And uh, it's based on the, the, the quote from Shakespeare from As You Like It, All the World's a Stage, and All the People are the Players. And um, it's very philosophical and it's a lovely tune. And uh, it's one of my favourites. And then in contrast, we've got Rick Davis coming up with this fairly dark song, Crime of the Century, but again, made even more special by the musicianship. This very simple piano riff at the end and uh, the intro with, with the verses, um, so they're planning the crime of the century. Well, what will it be? Um, very full of suspense and wonderful drumming from Bob C. Benberg towards the end of the track. And uh, with that riff, the piano, the piano, repetitive piano riff going on and the strings coming in, and it really builds to a climax. And it's just a wonderful end to the album. So I, I think I've gone in record, on record and saying I like Crisis What Crisis the best out of the Supertramp albums, but I suppose objectively speaking, it's hard to argue with Crime of the Century. Um, and again, to bring in the uh, the rule of which one would you play to a Martian, I think I'd probably pick this one. Uh, I think it's probably the most innovative and um, sort of, uh, yeah, sort of coming up with something new, a new sound. It was a breakthrough, indelibly stamped on the self-titled, a decent albums, but they really took their songwriting to a completely different, higher level, in my opinion. And, and the addition of John, Dougie and Bob uh, was just a stroke of magic. So well done, guys. Uh, the, the start of your glorious career as um, top performers, commercial, commercially speaking, as well as artistically, 
although in the US it didn't do terribly well, it got to 38 or something, I think. In the U UK it was a pretty big hit. And it wasn't until later where this album um, was certified gold in the States. I think it was not until after Quietest Moments in 77. Uh, so the US was a bit late in um, accepting Supertramp, but the UK, this was their breakthrough album. And I think in most of Europe, they were very popular in a lot of European countries. And um, uh, it's, it's not hard to see, um, to see why, because the musicianship is absolutely brilliant. And um, call it whatever you like, prog rock. I don't call it anything in particular. I just call it first class musicianship combined with first class songwriting. So thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.